my name is Niel van der Linde. We are at the Amsterdam Museum on the occasion of the Free Thinkers Exhibition, the Vrijdenkers Exhibition. Um, and I'm uh, invited to give a tour uh, as part of the new narratives organized by the museum. On the occasion of the Amsterdam Museum Exhibition Free Thinkers, I want to share some of my impressions of the exhibition. The exhibition for me is a timeline about the question, can we think, can we do, and can we say whatever we like? And given the fact that that historically never was for granted, how have we come this far? Exhibition starts with Spinoza, who lived from 1632 to 1677, and in fact with Erasmus as well. Erasmus lived from 1466 to 1536. However, I also want to start with a person who was very much influenced with, by Erasmus and who played a crucial, crucial role in the history of the Netherlands, including the circumstances that made it possible for the family of Spinoza, originally free, fleeing from Portugal, to settle in Amsterdam, and who had a huge role in making it possible for Spinoza to speak out. On December 31st, 1564, the Middle Ages ended, according to some scholars. That is, namely, when Prince William of Orange, the, the future leader of the Dutch revolt against the Spanish rulers, proclaimed freedom of religion, his New Year's Eve speech. He said, however strong I consider myself a Catholic, I cannot approve of princes attempting to rule the conscience of their subjects. William of Orange, who was born in 1503 and died in 1584 by a, uh, by a terrorist attack, we could say, followed in the footsteps of, of that Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus was a Dutch philosopher and Catholic theologian who is considered one of the greatest scholars of the Northern Renaissance. Actually, Erasmus' writings were in the bookshelf of each ruler at the time, including Charles V and Philip II, whom William of Orange movement revolted against. During the Eighty Years' War, started in 1568, the Netherlands gradually, but not always wholeheartedly, brought Erasmus and William of Orange in, in the years into practice. This meant that the French Protestant Huguenots, who were able to settle in Amsterdam, could settle here freely. Even Catholic refugees from Anglo-Saxon Protestant England, including Catholic members of the royal family, were welcome. Spinoza's ancestors were Maranos, Jews from the Spanish Peninsula who under force by Christian rulers had converted to Christianity, but who in the wake of the Portuguese Inquisition of 1536 had settled first in Antwerp, but when Antwerp was retaken by the Spanish in 1585 as part of the Eight Years' War, had fled to Amsterdam. And Baruch de Spinoza was born in Amsterdam. Let's hear a few of Spinoza's thoughts. No matter how thin you slice it, there will always be two sides. Next one. He alone is free who lives with free consent under the entire guidance of reason. The next one. Peace is not the absence of war, it is a virtue, a state of mind, a desire for benevolence, trust, justice. It means peace is something you have to fight for continuously. Another one. Not to laugh, not to weep, but to understand. That's the important. Spinoza does not rule out religion. He was not an atheist. On the contrary, freedom is essential to political stability and it is necessary to religious faith. It does not encourage faith, but it improves it. But, Spinoza's advocate, but Spinoza advocates a liberal democracy, a republic where each is granted the full freedom of to judge. This is particularly notable because he is among the first thinkers to advocate openly such propositions even at the risk of persecution and death. Whoever can think and speak freely is free. Is this the ultimate consequence? This is an installation by artist Joep Schrijvers about the cartoons of Gregorius Nekschot, who made insulting cartoons, per, by purpose insulting cartoons about the prophet Mohammed. There has been a lot about debate of how this installation was set up uh, in the museum. They blurred the pictures. Joep Schrijvers, the artist, says it means we are not yet free. This is about the fine line between freedom and hate speech, or just bland racism. To me, personally, I think uh, I like it the way this, ex uh, this uh, art in installation was set up, because at the same time, it uh, shows the message 
bij schrijvers, die artist, uh, die artist that he thinks blurring the, the cartoons is not really free expression, but on the other hand, you want to give the opportunity for people to watch it without having to run away and being insulted because of the, uh, the cartoons, because we know they're insulting, and that was how they were made by Nexhot. So they intended to, uh, to insult, but yet uh, by blurring them, you avoid that people have to run away and not get the message, and then we, ha we can have the debate. A close companion of Spinoza, Andrea Adrian Kurbach, suggested that the Bible was written by man. It was a book like any other. He had to go into hiding and later died after being sentenced to forced labor in the Amsterdam Rasphuis. This is uh, a symbol of the Rasphuis. You see people uh, handling a saw as part of, the, uh, of their uh, um, punishment. But things were move, moving for, forward. Anna Maria van Schuurman, the first Dutch woman to attend university, attended lessons from behind the curtain in order not to distract male students. But she was at, at least allowed to attend. However, we can ask why didn't the male students who feared to be distracted go and sit behind that curtain? Descartes, French philosopher who lived from 1596 to 1650. On the basis of rational thinking, he questioned authority. For this, he had to leave France. He migrated to the Netherlands. He was, he, he was able to work and write. Well, we must also add that Amsterdam was a printing capital of, in that time, and uh, one of the big industries of Amsterdam was printing. So maybe it was not only wholeheartedly because of, his, uh, because of our freedom of speech that we inv in, 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 invited him here and we welcomed him here, but maybe also for economical reasons. Yet. Amsterdam attracted many scientists from across Europe into the city, and it had a large number of Dutch scientists. Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was a lens maker, but he invented the microscope. Just by observing what he saw and thinking for his own, he discovered that life did not originate from inanimate matter, but from other life. He saw bacteria, plankton, and sperm, just by observing and being rational. Meanwhile, the Netherlands had one of, become one of the richest countries in the world, but there were dark sides to this pros uh, prosperity as well. As we know, the Netherlands had been one of the main West European powers involved in slavery and colonialism. It is unfortunate that the descendants of William of Orange now played a large pole, a part in colonialism and slavery themselves. The colonies and slave plantations had their own resistance leaders. In 1763, Kofi, alias Kofi, who came from Ghana, what's now Ghana, took charge of a major revolt against Dutch settlers in what's now Guyana. And he pro proclaimed himself governor of Bernice, and that was unprecedented. Tula, also known as Tula Rigaud, led a great uprising on Curaçao in 1795. Indonesia had Prince Dipo Negoro, 1785, to 1855, a Javanese prince who was opposed to the Dutch colonial rule. He was the eldest son of the Sultan of Yogyakarta and played an important role in the Java War before, between 1825 and 1830. After his defeat and capture, he was exiled to Makassar, where he died, 69 years old. His five-year struggle against the Dutch control of Java had become celebrated by Indonesians throughout the years, acting as a source of inspiration for the fighters in the Interne Indonesian National Revolution after World War II and the Independence War. I find it interesting that uh, the Dutch who, were, uh, uh, who proclaimed themselves or saw themselves as a, a beacon in free speech and, and freedom themselves colonized parts of the world and uh, were involved in slavery as well. And I, wrote, I, meant that, I mentioned that ironically uh, the rulers, the orange rulers themselves were deeply involved. So I was looking for, and I'm, I'm glad the exhibition covers a, f a few successors in the line of William of Orange who stood up against colonialism and slavery. Here is a video of a women's liberation demonstration. At that time, it was, it's remarkable to see that indeed the women were on the street, but there were a lot of men uh, walking with them. You can see from their clothes that they were all from, yeah, well-dressed, probably middle class, 
but the, the bystanders, all of them, they were what we should uh, consider as laborer suits. So it was a joint um, uh, effort by men and women alike to, to fight for women's liberation. And this meant that finally women would, be, would be, be, have full access to universities and full access to voting. That had not been the case until then. Two of the front women, front persons of the movement were Aleta Jacobs and Wilhelmina Drucker. Aleta Jacobs, by the way, she was Jewish. Another uh, example of minorities um, being able to uh, uh, fight for causes in different fields. Uh, they were all members of organizations that dealt with both science based on atheism as well as interested in Asian religions in a way that would have been forbidden in a century before. Second World War and the resistance. One of the persons we find here is Anton de Kom, who is known for his resistance in Suriname against colonialism. Actually, he was a resistance fighter and anti-colonialist author and was arrested by the Dutch authorities in Suriname. The protest against its arrest even led to two deaths. De Kom was subsequently exiled to the Netherlands, where he wrote Wij Slaven van Suriname, We Slaves of Suriname, a classic anti-colonial book. During World War, he was involved in the resistance against Nazi Germany. He was arrested again and sent to the concentration camps, where he died just before the end of the war in April before the war ended in May. Actually, only quite recently, he has been fully recognized as a World War II resistance leader. And his monuments and the streets named after him have been only added recently. For sure, that has to do with his other resistance, which we, as colonizers, didn't like that much. And maybe with his color? I now come to two Jewish members of the Dutch resistance who escaped Nazi genocide on Jews and who, during their hiding, came to conclusions about how the world after the war should be. This exhibition was organized as part of the commemoration of the foundation, the founding of the Dutch Humanist Union. And founder of the Dutch Humanist Union was Jaap van Praag. Here are two of his sayings. Anyone who is mentally resilient enough does not succumb to social pressure is not swayed by each and every expectation and carries on despite setbacks. Imagine you come to this noble conclusion after having seen the horrors of World War II and the Holocaust. And another one by him, as you can read, why do people support populist leaders and follow malicious ideologies? Because the weight of religions has been replaced. They have lost their function and as moral compass, according to him, and moral nihilism has arisen in many people. Van Praag believed it was important for non-religious people to also have a foundation for the ethical conduct and that they became mor morally resilient against demagogues and false ideo ideologies. Van Praag therefore attached great importance to moral resilience. Uh, this is also about today. What kind of leverage do influencers, algorithms, bubbles, fake news have on how we form our opinions? Benno Premsela, who was born in 1920 and died in 1997, was another Jewish survivor of the Second World War. He was a leading designer after the war, but meanwhile he was a major actor in the LGBTQI plus emancipation movement. The Nazis had also persecuted homosexuals, but meanwhile after the war, the official religious institutions had continued their discriminative attitude and pre-war laws were still in place. Think of Alan Turing in Britain, who was a war hero who had deciphered the, the code of the Nazis and after the world was forced to castrate himself and commit suicide. Okay. Gerard Reve, free speech versus insult. Gerard Reve was a, a Dutch novelist who at some point came out as homosexual. And during the 60s, he wrote as a satire uh, in his novels that he uh, imagined God being a, um, an ass, a donkey, and he had sexual intercourse with uh, Reve. He always considered it as something religious, but at the same time, of course, you can imagine that people took, uh, were insulted by it. 
he had a court, uh, he was trialed for it and was acquitted because it was, this was as far as free speech at that moment was able to come. Even later, he was awarded with a national award for literature by our Catholic Minister of Culture, Marga Klompe. One of the great, uh, as a Catholic, she was one of the great fighters for free speech. Um, and so this was an important uh, step in our, actually this was legally an important step in our law history about the, the margins, the space for free speech. As he is known for his derisory remarks in a support, support human setting, he's also made fun of people of color. And we, nowadays we would call him a, uh, we, we could consider him as a, yeah, right-wing, perhaps racist, but yeah, he said it in his time. It's not uh, uh, excusable, but uh, yeah, it's part of the man as a whole. And he was important in fighting the margins of free speech. In the recent time, two people had to pay with their lives for the expression. The novelist, filmer Theo van Gogh and the politician Pim Fortuyn. And we also see the politician Wilders, Geert Wilders, who is daily um, guarded because of threats on his life. Uh, on, on a different section in the uh, exhibition, we see the Turkish-Dutch novelist Lali Gül, who expressed her ideas and had a fight with her family, but is also threatened by uh, some, some people and is constantly guarded. Some criticists of the exhibition stated we, that we didn't hear the right-wing voices. This is not true. The, the, the exhibition also covers for time. I would say Joop Schrijvers, Schrijvers who, who uh, had the installation about uh, Nexgold, it's, 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 it gives the right-wing a voice. Are they right-wing? Is Lale Gul right-wing? Wilders is officially considered right-wing, but the ultimate consequence of free speech, is that right-wing? No, I don't think so. Enter Silvana Simons, when she criticizes the freedom just to say anything. Is freedom just to say anything, is that freedom of speech? Or could that, is that, does that include hate speech, as she has experienced it? While well, preparing this tour, I noted that some of the most inspiring quotes came from up till the 18th century. But as some contemporary uh, activists said, we are standing on the shoulders of previous generations. Free speech to me means saying as much as you can, and it's the same like, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's comparable to uh, the rights you have as a citizen. I have many rights as long as, as I'm not infringing on others' rights. But of course, uh, there's the English expression, uh, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. So in a way, words don't hurt, but they do hurt. And that's a fine line. So uh, in principle, I'm in favor of the possibility to say anything, but keep it civilized, and that's a permanent struggle. That's why the humanist movement is so important, and Van Praag is so relevant to today. Uh, it's, uh, civilization is not being able to do anything you want. It's be, be finding, uh, um, by fight and often by constant awareness, a way to behave in order to have your own right of way, your own um, space, but not to infringe too much, at least, on others' spaces. But I don't want others to use their space to in infringe on my rights.